As you can see, the topic of my presentation is dairy and diabetes, and we've already heard some very passionate discussion this morning about dairy, and so the timing of my talk is hopefully advantageous to shed some additional light on, on this issue. Um, in terms of my, uh, my conflicts of interest, I do receive some funding from Dairy Farmers of Canada, um, who are a supporter of this conference. I also receive funding from a number of other agencies, including the CIHR, the Canadian Diabetes Association, Canada Research Chairs Program, U of T Benning and Best Diabetes Center, in addition to the dairy farmers funding, which in part comes from Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada. I'm also a grant reviewer for dairy farmers. Uh, and in terms of mitigating bias, I guess I can say that the, the dairy fu uh, farmers funding is investigator initiated peer-reviewed and, and they don't have any role in the analysis or interpretation of the data. Um, and it really represents a portion of my total funding. So, so here's the outline for the talk today. I guess maybe the additional disclosure I have is that I'm a, an epidemiologist, not a trialist, although I have done some trial work. And so we'll, a lot of what I'll show you today are from the observational literature. Uh, we'll touch on, on, on some dietary patterns work. That's the, the, the topic of this particular symposium. We'll look at some evidence from trials. Um, and then I want to touch on some uh, potential mechanisms and, and, and biomarkers. And I've put those two together because I think at this stage in the dairy literature, we do, really don't know whether we have biomarkers or bioactives, and I'll touch on that a little bit, specifically <coughs> focusing on fatty acids, which, again, is advantageous given the discussion this morning, or hopefully advantageous. So in Canada, um, our recommendations for dairy are two to three servings per day, and, and really um, we're not meeting that by any means. You can see this figure from our national health survey showing the percentage below the recommended number of, of, of dairy servings. Um, the problem is, is widespread in, in age and gender groups, particularly in, in, in girls, 10 to 16, and in older adults. Um, we saw from uh, Dr. Bernard's uh, uh, talk this morning, trends in cheese consumption from USDA data. This is the accompanying slide for, for milk, beverage milk, and we can see since 1970 there's been a decline in total beverage milk, a, t a decline in, in consumption of whole milk, and kind of a leveling off since 1990 in low-fat milk. And so this underconsumption is potentially a problem given that dairy products are rich in a number of macro and micronutrients that potentially uh, have benefits in maintaining health and preventing chronic disease. Uh, we've heard a lot over the years about bone health, but increasingly we're hearing, uh, we're seeing literature that's focusing on other, other chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And so what do we know about dairy consumption and uh, type 2 diabetes from observational studies. And so over the past five or so years, we've had uh, about five meta-analyses of prospective cohort studies assessing this question. What, what, what does dairy intake do in the context of type 2 diabetes? And so I'm showing you only three of these for the sake of time. But uh, the the, the meta-analyses by Tong and Ayun, looking at total dairy consumption, reported in their summary relative risks that total dairy consumption was inversely related to the incidence of type 2 diabetes. Recently, we've had a new meta-analysis from Chen and colleagues, uh, which does not report the same finding. And I, I'll point out to you that, that the studies included in these metas are all different. Uh, some of it is, is uh, there's, there's overlap, but there, there's not pure overlap. Some of this is related to new studies being introduced and, and added to updated meta-analyses, but there are other selection factors that determine whether studies get in or not. It's interesting, in the Chen paper we see uh, the inclusion of three updated prospective analyses out to 10 years from the three Harvard cohorts, the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study and the Nurses' Health Studies 1 and 2. Now, what's also been interesting in this kind of quickly moving literature on dairy in the observational world is the question of dairy subtypes. And again, that's a little bit of a moving target as well. We can see from the Tong paper that low-fat dairy and yogurt were associated with reduced risk of incident type diabetes. 
from the Ayun paper, uh, a little bit more recent. The story is a little different, low fat. They found a similar finding, reduced risk of incident diabetes. Not yogurt, but cheese was, was related to lower risk of incident diabetes and no, no relationship for high fat or milk. And then in the most recent meta from Chen and colleagues, again, the only dairy subtype which was related to lower risk was yogurt, and all the other findings of the subtypes were null. So some of the work that I do involves the uh, underlying disorders of type 2 diabetes, and I think all of you as diabetes researchers will appreciate that once diabetes has been diagnosed using uh, uh, glucose criteria, metabolically the horse has been out of the barn for some time. And I'm referring to this idea that diabetes emerges because of chronic, long-standing, insidious uh, disorders of insulin resistance in several tissues, including the liver, the muscle, and uh, the adipose tissue. And then increasingly, we're, we're appreciating the importance of beta cell dysfunction as a primary underlying disorder uh, in the etiology of type 2 diabetes. The GWAS literature is telling us about the importance of beta cell genes in diabetes etiology. Some of you who may have been at the ADA will have seen Dr. Venket uh, Narayan's talk, Kelly West's talk on impaired fasting glucose in India. So I think if we, to understand any risk factor in the etiology of diabetes, it's also important to understand what's going on with the underlying disorders. It's also important to measure those disorders properly. And so um, uh, by that I mean use the best measure that you can in your study given all of the limitations that we face with logistics and funding and patient burden, et cetera. Validated, detailed measures uh, as much as possible. And in particular, when we, when we measure beta cell dysfunction, it's important to keep this concept in mind. And again, as a diabetes audience, you would have seen this figure before uh, uh, the, showing the compensatory relationship between insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion, sometimes referred to as the disposition index concept from Richard Bergman. And basically, in a nutshell, this uh, uh, concept holds that as insulin sensitivity decreases with advancing age or adiposity or declining physical activity, in normal physiology we see a compensatory response from the beta cells that maintains normal glycemia. Herzl Gerstein is going to come and talk to us in a couple of days and he's got a great paper telling us how the system works really hard to maintain tight glucose levels and this is one of the mechanisms of that. However, when beta cell dysfunction starts to emerge, either due to genetics, intrauterine factors, exogenous uh, uh, factors, uh, that compensation uh, is, is, becomes disordered and hyperglycemia eventually develops. The risk of using the wrong measure here is that you can misinterpret a, 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 an insulin secretion measure if it's looked at in the context outside of ambient insulin sensitivity. So what do we know from the observational literature on dairy and and these underlying disorders. Again, the literature is quite mixed. Uh, only one of these uh, studies here from IRIS used a detailed measure. There was no association. And many of these studies have used HAMA, which is a validated measure, but again, a, a lot less detailed than some of the other measures we have available to us. And, and importantly, only one measure that looked at beta cell function using HAMA-B, which again, there's some question about the utility of this measure as a measure of beta cell function. Now, the topic of this session is dietary patterns, and so I've tried to be observant of the requirements that uh, John and Cyril put on me about talking about dietary patterns, so I've got a couple of uh, slides on that, and we've heard some of this this morning, so I don't think I have to go into tremendous detail. Many of you will be aware that there are two general approaches to dietary pattern analysis, the so-called a priori uh, approach, where we calculate graded scores that describe ideal diets according to existing scientific literature, and we've heard a lot this morning about the Alternative Healthy e Eating Index, the Mediterranean Diet, and diet. The other way this is done is to use a posteriori approaches using multivariate statistical methods that take observed data, usually from food frequency questionnaires, uh, 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 and these methods include principal components analysis, reduced rank regression, and these give, uh, uh, give us um, uh, uh, patterns that come out from, from these particular approaches. <clears throat> 
Uh, now again, we've heard a lot this morning about where dairy sits in these different dietary patterns, so I, I won't dwell on it in, in great detail. Suffice to say that for the a priori approaches, there is an allowance for low-fat dairy products in low to moderate amounts. Uh, and we've seen from previous talks how these dietary patterns uh, are associated prospectively with the incidence of type 2 diabetes. I've got some references here of meta-analyses. You've heard some earlier this morning. What about the a posteriori approaches? It's a little bit more complicated, and, 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 and those of you who've done factor analysis or PCA will recognize the art and the science in these methods. But really, what we see is the emergence of one to four diet patterns, sometimes more. Usually, there's a healthy or prudent uh, diet pattern that emerges and an unhealthy or Western diet pattern. And these predict diabetes, as you might imagine. The way dairy loads on these patterns is a little bit complicated. The, the, um, uh, if, if present, low-fat dairy products tend to, to load on the healthy pattern, although that, all, that doesn't always happen. And, and those of you that do these methods will recognize some of that relates to how heavy the loading is and how it gets interpreted, um, whereas high-fat diets tend to load on detrimental patterns that are predictive of diabetes. What do we know from trials? I'm not going to do this any great service because uh, of lack of time, but what we can point out to you here is that there's an, uh, a recent meta-analysis from uh, Benatar and colleagues, and, and what they did was they meta-analyzed 20 studies, about 1,700 participants, median duration of, of 26 weeks. The mean increase in dairy was 3.6 servings per day. And what they found was that there was a significant increase in weight um, it, using both whole fat uh, and, and, and low fat dairy, but no significant changes in these other parameters that we've been talking about this morning. Uh, waist circumference, HAMA IR, fasting glucose, CRP, lipids and blood pressure. Now I'm, I'm going to pull out the HAMA IR figure for you just because it's, it's relevant to what we're talking about this morning. And you can see here, it's probably at the back, it's tough to see and I apologize for that, but for HAMA IR there was a very large and significant heterogeneity score. And hanging out with John, I, I have gradually been educated on how to interpret these meta-analyses parameters. And, and so really, all you have to do is look at the individual studies. We have two that were uh, indicating significant reductions in HAMA IR and two null studies. And so really, the, the, the jury is still out. Um, more recent publications, there's a paper by Rideout and colleagues showing an 11% improvement in insulin resistance after six months of low-fat dairy, and then a very recent systematic review of 10 trials of dairy and HAMA really showing mixed results. So what, what do we have in terms of mechanisms and relevant biomarkers? And I told you kind of why I've mixed those two things together. Well, a number of components of dairy uh, have or are currently being rigorously investigated um, um, in terms of their role in diabetes pathogenesis. Last year at the ADA, we had uh, um, um, a lot of attention on vitamin D, and I think really we need to wait and see what those trials are saying, most notably D2D, uh, PTAS's study. I'm going to focus on fatty acids for a moment because, as you've seen this morning, this is a quickly moving area, controversial. When it comes to the dairy fat, the, the fat profile of dairy, you can see it's very complex. Dairy contains trans, saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fatty acids. About 60 to 75 percent of those are saturates, and there are some naturally occurring trans fats. Now, um, we'll start with the biomarker story. Uh, these uh, fatty acids have been used in some studies as biomarkers of dairy intake. And in epi epidemiology, we're challenged by the measurement of diet on several levels. Um, the, one of the biggest issues is that our most commonly used instrument, the food frequency questionnaire, is subject to misclassification of intake, which tends to dilute effect estimates. And this gives you the mixed literature that we see in nutrition in general. Uh, biomarkers are thought to help to overcome uh, some of those problems, and these fatty acids have been looked at in the literature uh, as uh, uh, potentially useful uh, biomarkers of dairy intake. Uh, they uh, meet the criteria of utility in that uh, they are from exogenous sources, and they've been uh, validated in various media as potentially useful uh, markers of, of intake.
Are these merely biomarkers or are they bioactive? And again, this is controversial, very, very quickly moving literature right now. Some fatty acids have been intensively studied and, and many of you will be familiar with the CLA literature. Uh, uh, a lot of this is, is, is isomer specific. The naturally occurring uh, a CLA isomer is the 911 form, which, which uh, um, comes from ruminant sources, and there are some, um, some potentially beneficial mechanisms have been described, uh, including increases in GLUT4 and insulin receptor expression, reduction in macrophage infiltration and the down regulation of inflammatory markers in adipose tissue, and activation of PPAR alpha. Again, this literature is complicated because the, the, the other f major form, the 1012 form, can sometimes have different effects. Vicenic acid, which is the precursor of 911 CLA, also has been studied in terms of its PPAR, alpha and gamma activation. Um, then there are some other fatty acids that we're seeing more and more in the literature that we know less about. And so many of you will be familiar with uh, Darius Morzafarian's uh, studies uh, showing that transpamidylaic acid, or trans-161N7, is uh, inversely related to various outcomes, including type 2 diabetes. And they have speculated that this may be because uh, this particular trans fatty acid mimics non-hepatic cis 161N7 in improving insulin resistance and suppressing DNL. Um, and then another sort of set, the, 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 um, the odd chains, which are shown in some recent meta-analyses where the saturates have been broken down, have been standing out as, as not behaving like the traditional saturates, uh, such as palmitic acid, and that they have been protective, quote unquote. Is that because they're merely markers of dairy intake or because they're bioactive? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, Ingrid Santorin, who works in, in my group, has been digging around and really there's not much there as far as we can tell on mechanism. There's one study we've cited here that looks at accumulation in adipose tissue. So what do we know about the circulating fatty acids and, and outcomes? Again, the literature is quite mixed. I'll just point out that the red text indicates significant results We've maintained the direction of the association for the non-significant results in black. And again, literature is quite mixed. Much of the literature focuses, focuses on type 2 diabetes as an outcome. We know less about insulin resistance and beta cell function with these fatty, acid, um, uh, fatty acids. Um, and so that inspired us uh, to take a look at this question using some data from the insulin resistance atherosclerosis study. And this was a paper led by Ingrid um, in my group that came out in AJCN last year. So IRIS uh, is a prospective cohort study. Um, baseline exam was in the early 90s with a five-year follow-up. The unique thing about IRIS is that the participants were very, very richly characterized, in, including oral glucose tolerance tests, and everybody received a frequently sampled intravenous glucose tolerance test, which gives very detailed measures of insulin sensitivity, as well as beta cell dysfunction in the, in the context of the disposition index. Fatty acids were measured um, um, using gas chromatography, and from that profile, we were able to, uh, th that profile included 15O and trans 161N7, which we looked at in relation to incident diabetes at five years, as well as insulin sensitivity in the disposition index. So this is the figure from the logistic regression analysis, and you can see, so these are odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals with the unity line indicated here. And in the full cohort, we can see that with uh, standard deviation increases in the concentration of 15O, there was a significant reduced risk of five-year incident diabetes adjusted for confounders. We tested for interactions by gender, glucose tolerance, status, and ethnicity, and there were no significant interactions, although you can see the point estimates do move a little bit in some cases. Effects seem to be stronger in normal glycemics and Hispanic Americans, although uh, subgroup analysis in this cohort is, is underpowered. When we looked at the underlying disorders, we found that 15O was significantly related to, uh, significantly positively associated with insulin sensitivity and disposition index, indicating better insulin sensitivity and better beta cell uh, function. And in contrast, transpamidylaic acid was not related to either of these outcomes, nor was it related to incident diabetes. And we were sort of surprised by that, given that some of the papers had been coming out quite recently. So we looked at how these fatty acids related to self-reported dairy intake in the cohort from the FFQ. And 
um, 15-0 was, was quite significantly positively related to dairy intake in this cohort, while trans 16-1N7 was not. And in fact, it seemed to be picking up more of a, more of the intake of partially hydrogenated containing foods. All right, so discussion, this is just for this paper, 15O was a marker of dairy intake in this cohort and it was related to insulin sensitivity, beta cell function, and lower risk of diabetes. That was not the case for transpalmitoleic acid. Second last slide, um, future directions. This is just my opinion. I think we need more data on the roles of dairy subtypes and its components. We need to be careful when we characterize the underlying disorders of diabetes as best you can, use detailed, validated measures of insulin resistance, beta cell function, possibly some of these other disorders that we know relate to diabetes. There was a session on insulin clearance at the ADA that some of you may have seen, and we've heard a little bit about inflammation. Um, we also need to assess the full spectrum of dairy fatty acids um, in these studies, and that requires you to have a conversation with your favorite lipid biochemist, because there are some important methodological issues that, that are related to that, including the identification of the right standards, uh, as well as the column that it, the right column to pick up that part of the fatty acid spectrum that contains many of these dairy fatty acids. Trials, again, um, um, a careful consideration of dose, duration, dairy form, and content, as well as outcomes. Conclusions, I think uh, total dairy in most meta-analyses is inversely related with type 2 diabetes incidence, although the most recent meta uh, was not consistent with that, and we have inconsistencies with subtypes. Low-fat dairy is part of di dietary patterns that inversely relate to diabetes risk. <coughs> Trials have been inconsistent, but I think we have some work to do on design issues. What are the mechanisms? We don't know that exactly yet. A couple of intriguing avenues particularly with fatty acids, are these bioactives or biomarkers? More work's needed. And I just want to highlight uh, Ingrid's work, uh, AJCN paper, as well as Robin Glicksman, who's been doing diet patterns analysis in our group. Other members of my group, funders I've talked about, is, and this is the IRIS investigator team. Thank you very much.